All right, so, so we've heard uh, two uh, theoretical talks and now it's a uh, uh, high time to get an experimental perspective. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Andrew Goodwin, who is a university research professor and professor of materials chemistry at, at Oxford. Um, Andrew obtained his PhD at Sydney in 2004 and then uh, later um, obtained a second PhD uh, in Cambridge in, in 2006. Um, so, Andrew, very much looking forward to your talk. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Johannes. Hopefully you can hear me and yeah. just share my screen. That works. Brilliant. Well, well thank you very much. Um, real pleasure to be part of this meeting. I always like a meeting on disordered and amorphous materials. We talk about crystalline ordered things so much in materials chemistry, it's a really nice, it feels like we're all rebels together here today, but um, uh, not only am I an experimentalist, I'm also gonna be a slight um, odd, odd one out today by I think talking about disordered crystalline materials rather than amorphous, but hopefully I can convince you there's still lots of interesting problems. Uh, and the particular family that I, I'm going to focus on is this family of materials called Prussian blue analogs. But before I delve into that, more generally, our interest in the group here is really in this link between disorder and, uh, and properties via, of course, the, the structures of materials. And there's lots of really interesting problems on route there, as we all, as we all know. Um, not least, of course, the idea that somehow, as chemists, we're going to have to control the disorder that's present within a material if we're then going to somehow exploit disorder eventually in, in the properties of those materials. And um, I would say that experience tells us it is hard enough to control structure in ordered materials. Um, you know, how on earth do we try and control that in disordered materials? And we, we, we've heard some really nice thoughts along these lines in, in Julia's talk in particular. Um, but given that sense of, of it feeling a little bit overwhelming and given that we've all just had a coffee, I thought I'd start um, just with a, a little story, nothing to do with uh, with chemistry per se. This is a picture of some starlings. I've got to be careful, my Australian accent, I've, I've given this talk once where people thought I was talking about starling for some reason, but these starlings, these little birds, that form these beautiful collective structures that, um, are, you know, obviously an example of active matter, some very complex collective behavior. And it's natural to ask the question, where does this complexity arise? You know, it can't really be the case that each um, each bird is communicating with every other bird and, and somehow coordinating this thing on mass. So in many ways, in the same way as saying, how do I uh, create some sort of intelligent uh, complex structure within a material? How do, how do the birds um, make these really beautiful patterns that you see here? And uh, one of the people who gave some really great insight into this is this person, Craig Reynolds. He's a professor of computer science at uh, MIT. And a few years ago now, he came up with these three um, very simple intuitive rules that he suggested, you know, may, may play some role in governing this emergent uh, behavior of, of, say, birds. And uh, the first of these, very straightforward, maybe the birds are trying not to bump into each other. Second rule that maybe like sheep, these birds are all trying to go in roughly the same direction as their neighbors. And finally, what he taught, he termed cohesion, the idea that the birds don't want to get lost. So there's something, you can see these things acting in tension one with the other, the separation trying not to bump in and cohesion not to get too far away. And what's really neat is that if you take those very, very simple local rules, you can nevertheless simulate um, behavior that looks, at least to the um, uninformed eye like mine, it looks very similar to the kind of flocking behavior you'd see in birds. And of course, the reason for putting this in is this concept that all of us know and love, that complex behavior, complex structures can emerge from very simple interactions. And I, that gives me a great deal of hope as a materials chemist, because it means if we can understand those sorts of links, then perhaps by tuning those simple interactions, I've got some control over the complexity that emerges in, in my system. Now, just, just while we're still in that slightly post-coffee mood, um, Craig Reynolds is not only a professor of MIT, he actually has, a, has an Oscar, as some of you might know. He won the Oscar for Lion King, not, not he wasn't playing Simba or anything like that, but this was um, the first film that actually used his algorithm um, to, uh, to generate the sort of herding behavior of animals. As seen here, for example, whatever they are, buffalo or wildebeest or something coming down. They're, they're all simulated, at least the positions and directions are simulated using um, those simple rules that he showed previously. 
Okay, so this idea that simple rules can give rise to complexity, of course, um, well known and loved within materials chemistry. One, you know, can go back to lots of different examples. Here's one so-called ANI model, the anisotropic next nearest neighbor interaction model that famously has been used to uh, explain the complexity of layered systems such as the silicon carbon, uh, silicon carbide uh, polytypes, for example. So we teach undergraduates, of course, you get hexagonal close packing or cubic close packing, but in these sorts of systems, you can have very complicated packing arrangements um, that one can explain in terms of a competition between the arrangement of neighboring layers and next neighbor layers. Um, and this, these beautiful sort of um, diagrams, such as you see here, where really you've got extremely few parameters. You've got to balance this kappa term here, balance between those two interaction types and just temperature on the vertical scale. And you end up with these phases um, that can take you know, many tens of layers or perhaps even longer to repeat in some of these. These are thermodynamically stable phases um, dictated by this very simple model and is placed into not just silicon carbides, but perovskites and so on, lots of different sorts of structures. Here's a model very close to my own heart. I like this one very much. This is a case of sort of the uh, Ising triangular antiferromagnet. So if I've got some system that involves a triangular arrangement of, of sites, and I'm going to, uh, I've got some degree of freedom that each site can be in one of two states. If neighboring sites are trying to be in op opposing states, the system is famously geometrically frustrated and the ground state of this system has no long range order, but it's not random. Um, on the right hand side is a, is an image of some of some model close to the ground state. You see these sort of black and white patterns. These are those two states that you might observe. The whole system is trying to avoid having triangles such as this one here um, of three neighboring states, as uh, three neighboring sites in the same state. So um, th this model was famously solved by Daniel back in, in 1950. I just wanted to rephrase this ever so slightly. It will become uh, obvious why in a moment. Um, here, the reason that this system is so complicated, I think can be traced back to the idea that the triangular lattice is a tripartite lattice. It can be subdivided into three interpenetrating lattices in a unique way. It, um, but obviously in this case where you're trying to decorate it with equal amounts of two different states, there's no way of doing that if it's tripartite. If we were trying to decorate it with three different states, such that neighboring states were different, then um, actually we'd have no problem because it's tripartite and you end up with a unique ordering after translations such as the one shown on the left-hand side here. So incompatibility between how you're trying to decorate the lattice and the geometric properties of the lattice itself. Okay, so when I talk about disordered crystals, these are the kinds of systems that we're thinking about. Um, and uh, an obvious question is how on earth do you know you've got one of these? And here we're lucky that the um, experiments that we use to probe ordered states, in particular, say, crystallography, actually has some sensitivity, in fact, some quite detailed sensitivity to these so-called correlated disordered states. Um, what I'm showing you here is a diffraction pattern, actually, of a protein crystal, where the protein can adopt one of two orientations, uh, and neighboring protein molecules are trying to orient themselves in opposite senses. So this is a kind of, you know, biological version of that toy model I showed you previously. And this is its X-ray or one slice of its X-ray diffraction pattern. What you see are a set of spots. These are obviously Bragg reflections that are characteristic of the periodicity of the underlying lattice. But we also have this beautifully structured honeycomb-like uh, diffuse scattering here that is telling us about the disorder. So basic rules, if you haven't seen these before, and I, I'm conscious there are many experts here in the audience today, but if you see disorder, if you see diffuse scattering, your system is disordered. And if that diffuse scattering is beautiful, then your disorder is probably beautiful. In other words, if the diffuse scattering has structure in it, then your disorder is not random, but has, has strong correlations within it, okay? And this sort of beautiful pattern you see here is characteristic of that particular state. So we, we would specialize in interpreting these sorts of diffraction patterns. So that's just a bit of background to the kind of techniques we might use in our way of thinking about different things. I wanted to talk to you now um, a little bit about the, the Prussian blue analogs. Um, Prussian blue itself is really famous, obviously. It's, it's often considered as kind of the birthplace of, of coordination chemistry, um, which makes it sound very, very grand as if you know people were uh, intentionally, you know, making all sorts of uh, chemicals in some modern-like way. In fact, 
uh, no, you know, disrespect obviously to Dees Buck and Dipple, but uh, Prussian blue was discovered by um, dropping cyanide onto pig's blood and that pig's blood went blue. Um, that turned out to be really quite lucrative um, because blue pigments were extremely expensive at the time. So this was, of course, a way of making something quite cheaply. Um, in, in due course, it was realized that all that was happening was the cyanide was reacting with iron. You didn't need to slaughter a pig in order to, to generate Prussian blue. But this gave access to a, a blue pigment that then turned up in lots of, uh, lots of paintings, such as the ones on the right here. But its, it's synthesis is reported um, back at the start of the um, 18th century. So that's, that's Prussian blue itself. I need to talk a little bit about the structural chemistry. And I know that for many of you, this will be uh, well known, but just in case you haven't seen it before, let me just build it up. It's, it's, it's a touch, um, well, a touch complicated. So the general family is actually based on a really simple structure, uh, such as that adopted here by this cadmium hexacyanoplatinate. And if you were to just look at the cadmium and platinums, actually this would look really like a rock salt arrangement, alternating cadmium two plus, platinum four plus. And wherever you see a black line here, that's a cyanide ion connecting the two together. There are three times as many edges here as there are vertices. Um, and that's sort of fixing this composition that you see here. If you back that out, this is telling you that the sum of the charges on the cadmium and the platinum have to sum to six because we have these six cyanides here for two metals, three to one, six to two. So that's this stoichiometric cadmium hexacyanoplatinate. Prussian blue is actually a mixed valence, uh, mixed valence cyanide of iron, and it contains iron in the two plus and three plus oxidation states. And as, as you'll appreciate, two and three don't sum to six, they sum to five, of course. And the way the system gets around it is to incorporate some vacancies here on these blue sites, okay? So in order to get the charges to balance, what you need is one quarter of those blue sites to be vacant. And this creates a void within your structure shown here as these green spheres. Now, um, uh, if, you, if you think about this sort of rock salt like arrangement, the, the blue sublattice that is partially vacant, that's an, a face center cubic sublattice and a quarter of those sites are, are missing. Um, the site percolation threshold for the FCC lattice is about 20%. So if these vacancies were random, then actually all of these vacancies would connect up to form a percolating pathway. As it happens, it's known that they avoid being next to each other. And this was proven in a very famous single crystal study of the 1970s. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, they, they can sit on, on, one, on a subset of sites of that FCC lattice such that you don't get any connections at all. And so Prussian blue is not, not actually really very porous. Now the Prussian blue analogs that I'm finally gonna to get to talk to you about today, um, they've got a similar sort of composition except a variety of different two plus and three plus transition metals on them. And these sites are now switched and this changes the number of vacancies again, such that a third of that face center cubic sub lattice, the one shown in blue is now missing. And this is at the point now, it wouldn't matter how you arranged your vacancies, they have to connect up to form some sort of network of pores. And that's going to be the key thing that we're interested in characterizing. Before I talk a little bit more about that, let me just come back to this idea of uh, why the system might be complex. We're taking a face centered cubic sub lattice and trying to decorate a third of those sites with vacancies. Just as we saw for the Ising triangular antiferromagnet where a triangular lattice was tripartite, here what we have, the FCC lattice is quadripartite. It's, it can be deconstructed into four interpenetrating primitive cubic sublattices. And we're trying to decorate that quadripartite sublattice with a third of the sites occupied in some particular way. And this is going to lead to some frustration. It's a similar problem you encounter, for example, in the families of say relaxer ferroelectrics like PMN, where again, you have this one to two ratio of two uh, atom types sat on that sublattice. Okay, so I've mentioned that we're interested in these sort of poor networks. And the reason for that is that Prussian blue analogs are actually enormously diverse family of materials where they're applied in lots of different areas. And those applications very often depend on getting matter in and out of the crystal structure. So here are some examples. Let me just pick up on some of them. So it's battery materials. These are the so-called hexacyanoferrates and hexacyanomanganates. These are, for example, cathode materials where you're trying to get ions in and out of this out of the system. Um, in catalysis, they're known as double metal cyanides, DMCs. The fact that you have lots of different names for these, they're already hinting at the fact that these are extraordinarily 
well applied materials. And there's a whole bunch of other sorts of applications, including, say, the work that Jeff Long's done on, on gas storage and so on in, in those materials. So for all these applications, you need to understand the pore structure. Um, and that's going to depend on the arrangement of the vacancies. Okay, so you could imagine that understanding that, that pore structure is pretty crucial. Um, why are there any questions remaining about this? Well, a few answers there. Um, <laughs> the first thing is that um, Prussian blue analogs are, are usually obtained as very fine powders. They're very insoluble materials. And this is because cyanide binds very strongly to transition metals. It's why cyanide as a free iron, of course, is so poisonous. If we eat it, it just by, finds the nearest transition metal, often iron in hemoglobin, and binds it. And it's also, also why, sorry, um, Prussian blue analogs themselves are not poisonous because the cyanide is already bound to a transition metal. We can and do eat these all the time. In fact, there, there's some E numbers. They tend not to tell us that some of our E numbers are cyanides, but anyway, they are. Um, and that's because the cyanide's already bound. So these things are very, very insoluble. They crash out as fine powders. And uh, there's essentially no single crystal work on these materials at all. And when you take those powders and you have a look at their diffraction patterns, they're deceptively simple, okay? You see these sorts of, um, sorts of patterns here. They're really just reflecting the underlying sort of five cubic angstrom unit cell that you see here, okay? So very, very difficult to get any information out. And the field has been sort of forced to assume that the arrangements of these vacancies were effectively random, even though people know they, they probably aren't or, or couldn't be. Okay, so um, over about seven years or so, we very slowly grew some single crystals with a variety of different Prussian blue analogs. And here we're using a kind of shorthand to show you their uh, compositions. So you have two different types of transition metals. These would be the pink and the blue spheres in those diagrams. Um, and you can change their compositions. And here are just a bunch of these. We only got eight, but actually it was quite hard to get even eight and one might want more, but that's where we are. Uh, and these are slices through the experimental X-ray um, diffraction patterns uh, for those different crystals. And again, you see, as you might expect, a whole bunch of spots and also this structured diffuse scattering. The fact that we're saying diffuse scattering is telling us they're disordered, that's what, that we expected. But the fact that the diffuse scattering has structure to it is telling us that the disorder is not random. Now, um, I, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time, if that's okay, just talking about um, how we can, in, in sort of heuristic terms, extract some information about the arrangement of vacancies just from one of these, of these patterns. Um, and we, we made use of a relatively recent development in the field called three-dimensional difference pair distribution function analysis. And that, that's a, a lot of terms all in one go. Um, it's actually closely related. We've already seen it in, in both of the last talks, actually, these pair distribution functions that we all know and love. And this is related to a kind of three-dimensional version of it. So let me just very quickly explain what, what you do here. So we take our, our diffraction pattern and we punch out all of the Bragg peaks. So we're just looking at the diffuse scattering. And then we take the Fourier transform of that. And we end up in real space. And just as a pair distribution function is telling us about correlations between atoms separated by a given distance, so is this function telling us about correlations between pair of atoms, but we now have spatial resolution. We can say something about orientation. Also, because we've punched out the Bragg peaks, what we're seeing is not a pair distribution function per se, but the deviations away from the average structure. And so our peaks now have sort of positive and negative values, for example, and they're shown here in, in red and blue. Okay. So this is an example of one of these functions on the right-hand side. And I just wanted to see how I could go at sort of pulling out um, how, how one might sort of hand wavingly interpret this. Uh, and my reason for sketching these is not to show you that I didn't put any effort into making the slides, just to show you as a kind of a hand wavy way of interpreting it. This pattern on the right hand side, I'd say we can kind of deconvolve into two components. So you can see these kind of crosses. Um, and those crosses, which I've pulled out here on the left hand side, uh, we could think of as being convolved with a function that is, say, red at center, then blue here, and red here, and blue here, and so on. So um, that's this function that I'm showing at the top here. Now, the reason for doing this is that this little cross, this feature that keeps turning up, this is really the set of pair correlations associated with a hexacyanometallate um, anion. It's the thing that's going to be vacant in our structure, okay? The bit at the top, where we just have 
positive, negative, positive, negative. This is the kind of feature you would see in something with um, just compositional disorder. So vacancies present or absent. The fact that, uh, so the, the way to interpret this is that at the center here, what it's saying is if I have a vacancy at one point, I have a vacancy at that same point. Well, that, that makes sense. But then the, the next one along says, if I've got a vacancy somewhere in my cell, then there's a probability, it's more likely than random that there's another vacancy one unit cell along. Whereas where it's blue, it's saying, actually, it's unlikely there's another vacancy in that particular position, for example. And this is a way to interpret this pattern. So what's neat here is that if you sort of, you know, ignore the little crosses, you're looking at something that just depends on the vacancies and doesn't, doesn't really worry with the, the, the actual structure of that hexacyanide methylate. So I know this is an audience that is not afraid of a Fourier transform. So if we take the Fourier transforms of each of those components, we can think about how these work out in reciprocal space. So the Fourier transform of this is just some blobby function. It's just a form factor associated with this, this molecule. And the Fourier transform of this object here is, is going to turn out to be just like a grid of lines. And you know, I'm, I'm waving some hands here. But when you come back to your experimental pattern, this is showing you where the things come together. Because they were a convolution in real space, these two things were a product in reciprocal space. The fact that we have these lines, this is coming from the vacancy correlations. And the fact that you've got this sort of cross of intensity with some gaps here and so on, that's coming from the form factor. So if all we're interested in is just what the vacancies are doing, we need to get rid of this. And there's a very neat way of doing this that was come up with by Ella Schmidt and Reinhard Nader, which is just to divvy up reciprocal space and take an average over all of these different free run zones. And uh, sorry, um, and that, that gives you this tiny little tile which captures the lines that you see at the top here. Okay, so that's got all the information actually about the vacancy correlations within it. So when I showed you these patterns down the bottom right hand corner are little tiles um, and those, those correspond to the averages of the diffuse scattering over all those free run zones. And they contain the information about the correlations in the vacancies. So at this point, what we can say is that for these different systems, irrespective of the chemistry, actually we've got different vacancies arrangements even though they're all disordered, okay? Uh, and it's obvious at this point to try and ask, well, you know, what are the implications of that? And, you know, is there any sense that we might control those disordered vacancy arrangements? Okay, so here we are, the two questions. Why is this system co so complex? I mean, I often think these are questions I could ask about myself. Why am I so complex? No. But why are the vacancy distributions so complex? And why is it that changing compositions, often quite subtly, is affecting where we're at? Okay, and I, I think those are the, the two key questions that I'll try and answer in the, in, in the remaining bit of this, of this talk. Just as an, there are lots of different ways you could go about modeling this system. And just as an aside, I wanted to flag that in a parallel world of say, rock disordered rock salt battery materials, people would explore the same sorts of things. Here's a very nice paper really, that came out of Gert Cedars group. Um, they're looking at, at similarly complex materials and the approach that the group, groups like this would take would be to say, well, um, why don't I generate lots of different possible vacancy arrangements, use DFT to work out the energies of those different arrangements, and then try and back out some empirical potentials that are going to govern what's happening for a given system. And of course, that does work, and it gives you a set of potentials associated with different systems, but it's not the approach that we took here because we were interested in, I think, um, understanding as an overview, what is it about this Prussian blue analog architecture that's really giving us that sort of sensitivity and complexity um, as a structure type. So we went around this in really quite a noddy way, and I'm conscious I'm talking to a simulation audience that are gonna look at this and potentially laugh, I hope not. What we thought was, well, from a sort of materials chemist perspective, what are the likely local interactions that might be responsible for what we're seeing here? So recall that we have two interpenetrating FCC lattices, and I'm gonna represent the non-vacant one by little circles here and the partially vacant one by these squares. Remember that one third of the sites are missing on that square sub -lattice. So if a third are missing, there may well be some driving force to have that third missing in a kind of homogeneous way. And Pauling would have talked about this, you know, as a sort of a, a local electroneutrality. And of course, if we plug in any sensible potentials, we're gonna get this for free anyway, but we can put this in as a noddy sort of term here in this, in this energy expression here. 
just to say that the number of vacancies around a given site should probably be two on average. There must be some penalty to having a deviation away from that vacancy. If you're then going to have two vacancies, they could either be next to each other or they could be opposite one another. And this either breaks or preserves local inversion symmetry. And you might imagine that different electronic configurations here on the site could bias the system one way or the other. Okay, So we were interested just to understand from this very simple chemical perspective, um, what sort of phase behavior you might expect. So we've got these two J's that go into a very simple model where we're just trying to understand what happens if you distribute vacancies according to them. So here's the kind of phase diagram that you end up, a bit like what we saw for those any models that I showed you before. So the horizontal axis is a balance of the two J terms. Vertical axis is our uh, sort of effective Monte Carlo temperature. And then at each point here, we run a, a series of Monte Carlo simulations according to the, those particular values of J and temperature, um, where we're just swapping vacancies and, and uh, present sites. We can then calculate from that the diffuse scattering pattern that we'd expect to see. Um, and that's going to come out as one of those little tiles, effectively like we'd seen experimentally. So we can tile our phase diagram using that diffuse scattering. And this is this kind of diffuse scattering phase diagram that you see here. So the first thing is for this very simple model, actually we do see lots of diffuse scattering, lots of disordered states that vary really quite quickly with um, respect to the uh, two values of J. So that simple model, I think because we've got this problem of one third on the FCC lattice is actually very sensitive. Moreover, we can now do this thing where we take our experimental um, diffuse scattering patterns and kind of just match them. Where, where do these best fit? Do, do they match what we see in our Monte Carlo models? And actually to a first order, they do pretty well. So this is you know, taking those experimental patterns and distributing them. This is where they would end up. And moreover, they kind of end up in, in semi-sensible ways. So let me just pull out a couple of examples. Um, if we have copper on this uh, circular site, copper two plus has a D9 electronic configuration that we would expect to have a strong driving force for preserving inversion symmetry. And it lies on the side of the phase diagram that's associated with that preservation of inversion symmetry. Likewise, zinc two plus, cadmium two plus, D10 configurations systems that in their own cyanides have tetrahedral coordination, they end up on the right-hand side here in green and, and orange in this pseudo tetrahedral arrangement. If we grow a crystal quickly, such as this pink one here, we end up further up our effective Monte Carlo temperature axis than if we grow the same system more slowly, such as we do down here. We've only got one example really of this, so it could be completely wrong, but anyway, that's, that's where we end up. So it feels at least just by looking at things that there's some, some sensible things going on. And kind of the way we're thinking about this is that perhaps choosing composition allows us to navigate where we are in that J space and the way in which we make something might allow us to access effect, different effective Monte Carlo temperatures. And in doing so sort of navigate this configuration. space. Now I've drawn in some different lines here and given them some different labels associated with these, these sorts of phases. Um, the reason for this is that even though they're, though they're disordered, these systems have different pore characteristics that are quite hard to sort of say anything. They're not ordered, for example. So here are two, have different phases. Um, they've got different arrangements of pores relative to one another. It's very difficult to see these sorts of things by eye, but you can back these things out more quantitatively using say, what's the coordination number of nodes and so on in your, uh, in your pore networks. And there's lots of things that you can calculate from these Monte Carlo configurations, for example, that show you how you're changing the characteristics of your port network as you navigate that phase space. So this, this is sort of the basis for us drawing lines, for example, on that phase diagram. So just to pull out a couple of ones, um, tortuosity, a great, a great word I didn't know it beforehand for the porous media people talk about how hard it is to get from one side of your structure to another. That varies as you navigate this phase space, how anisotropic your system is. Um, combined properties like this conductance, this is to do with how quickly you could get a certain amount of matter in and out of your network. And that's optimized up here in the top left-hand corner, for example. So these are properties of your network that you that depend on the disorder, depend on the fact the disorder isn't random, 
And in principle, you might have some control over using uh, uh, by tuning, say, composition and how you make these different sorts of materials. So um, that was just the main story I wanted to tell. Let me um, finish with a, a shameless plug here. Just um, it happened actually today, we've got the page numbers for this. Arkady uh, and I have written a little paper on this idea of you know, how we might go about sort of intentionally designing disorder into different crystalline materials. And kind of the approach that we're taking here is thinking about the, you know, the different sort of elements that you can bring together. The degrees of freedom, we were talking about composition vacancies, for example, in the examples today, but there's lots of different things we can do there. The interactions between those and the lattices on which these different things um, sit. So um, let me uh, finish there by thanking the people involved. These are the people involved in that study, in particular, Arkady Simonov, who's really driven a lot of that three-dimensional difference pair distribution function analysis, but uh, a whole bunch of uh, really talented uh, collaborators here and a variety of different funding sources um, and most dear to my heart, the European Research Council. Um, but thank you also for your attention. Very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was uh, really fantastic uh, and uh, <laughs> very enjoyable, uh, in particular how you dealt with uh, DFT. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there, there is a question from uh, Ian Robinson. Uh, Ian, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Beautiful talk, uh, very uh, thought provoking and, and just what we want uh, for, for the discussion here. Um, I, I have a crystallographic question actually, which is that the vacancies in your Prussian blue analog are still fully decorated with cyanide. And I'm wondering, if the cyanides all have their ends towards the vacancy or all have their uh, C's towards the vacancy and or, or possibly whether this changes with uh, with the structure that is the, the decorated vacancies in the in the crystal lattice um thanks for that Ian and, and I'm sorry I was really not very clear with this at all the vacancies themselves in nearly every case involve an entire hexacyanometallate unit so it's not just a metal but it's six cyanides around it and as you've identified, that leaves a kind of coordination site vacant on the neighboring metal that is generally understood to coordinate a water molecule itself. Now, as you heat these materials, for example, you can see in the TGA that at different temperatures, you can start to pull that off. Um, and there may be cases where not all of those sites are occupied as well. I glossed over it, but coming back to the crystallography, this is why in that, when I was talking about the convolution, the, the thing that you're seeing in the 3D Delta PDF is a cross that includes the cyanides on that, on that component, if that makes sense. I'm sorry I wasn't clear with that. No, 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 well, you, you're giving an overview talk partly. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're very rich uh, in, in that direction as far as their applications as well, because all of those things are very relevant to catalysis and uh, storage and et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you know that. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Um, while we're waiting, I, I was wondering, why is it so hard? I mean, you said it took you basically seven years to get seven samples working. Why is it so hard? Um, it's primarily because they're so insoluble. So every time you try to make a single crystal, it just wants to be a powder. A very crisp, well, sort of, you know, they give nice sharp diffraction patterns, but you really have to allow these components to mix super slowly in order to, to be able to grow little crystals. And you know, you can't you can't grow these crystals. These are not, if I dare use the term, they're not physicist crystals. You know, we can't grow them from a melt or something like that. We have to grow them just in solution very slowly as things come together. Um, so their insolubility is really what, what, what causes dramas here. And a very open question I would say is um, do these same things happen in the powders, which is what people use experimentally? You know, you know, is it by growing crystals that we've actually included all of these correlations? So I think there's some open questions there, for example. Let's see. Uh, there's a question from uh, Eric Macke. Eric, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this, for this talk. I was deeply inspired also when I read your paper. Um, I have one question regarding the, the Prussian blue analogs. I think it's quite known that they are mostly used in um, aqueous environments. So, and also oftentimes synthesized in those aqueous environments. So I was just wondering if you have any idea um, how the water molecules that are 
like often included in the structure could possibly alter those patterns or have any influence at all or do you think they don't they don't really matter no i think i think they absolutely do and they will contribute um i'd say this is one of the areas where actually having relatively poor real space resolution is kind of working in our favor so when people had looked at Prussian and blue analogs using conventional pair distribution function one dimensional uh -huh. you do have a lot of you're sensitive to is it cyanide is it water what distances are they at and so on and, and so on and so forth and actually this complicates the analysis in my opinion until you have a proper structural model all of our scattering is really dominated by the interactions between the cobalt and it and the cyanides and this allows us to essentially look at the diffraction data with a sort of squint in the eye and just focus on the uh, the correlations in the vacancy. So I think now that we've got good models of this, or I think decent models of it, sure. this is the time that we could now come back and test for different arrangements of water molecules, you know, as Ian was saying, for example, as well, do we have the sensitivity to the arrangements of those water molecules uh, within the vacant sites and so on? I suspect that for a lot of this, the water structure is possibly a bit less structured than the vacancy arrangements themselves. And so it's going to be a little bit more complicated to look at, but it's a really relevant point um, that, that I think we're now starting to get the tools to have a look at properly. Okay, sure. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Andrew.